guys. So I got a special guest with me here today. This is uh, Sam Kerwin, right? Um, so he is from, uh, say, your university again? No, the University of Northern Colorado. All right, and he's doing some venom extractions today for Dr. McAsee's lab and some of the projects that they've got going on. So he's going to be a really cool way of not the classic milking. Um, this seems like a lot safer, a lot less stress on the animals. So we're going to watch all that unfold. He's getting samples from Grand Canyon rattlesnakes, from our Arizona black rattlesnakes, and from our Lutosis, our Great Basin rattlesnake. You want to talk just for a split second about what you're going to do and how it all works? Yeah, so our lab focuses on biochemical ecology. Right. So we look at how these toxins and these enzymes produced by these animals actually interact with their environment and how the environment interacts with them and kind of has influence over them. So the snakes we're going to be extracting today, we're doing for a couple reasons. One is that biochemical ecology reason. Another one is more biochemical, looking at how these enzymes work, how they break down, and how we can better treat them possibly in the future, things like that. And then the Grand Canyon is a great snake to take some samples from because we actually don't have a lot of sampling from them being where they are. It's kind of hard to take samples out of a national park. Yeah. <laughs> um, so getting some samples out of these guys in captivity is really, really valuable for us in a lot of other research that we're doing. We'll get to it and uh, yeah, can't wait to see this guy work. So what we're going to be doing is actually uh, kind of indu inducing the snakes into a little bit of kind of like a relaxed state using some isoflurane. And then from there, we're going to pin them down and actually have their be able to manipulate their venom glands and then squeeze venom out. And it's a very, very relaxed process. It's safer for us, it's safer for the animals. And at the end of the day, everyone walks away A-OK. -okay. Yeah, so we're just waiting for um, a lack of like mobility or a lack of um, riding response, just uh, a much more relaxed uh, musculature, uh, just like how we kind of suffer less injuries in car accidents if we're asleep or if we are passed out for some reason. Um, the same thing kind of applies in this scenario where if you're doing anything hands-on with the snake, if they are more relaxed, even if that's chemically induced relaxation, they're much more likely to be safe during this entire process, which is what we want. God, I can feel how full these are already. Yeah. Okay, so you're just sucking it out. Yeah, so there's an interesting, like the entire idea of fangs like growing in, like new fangs like constantly replacing old ones mm -hmm. is really, really interesting. It's, it's a project that I'm kind of wanting to work on, but it's the, the way that the venom flow shifts from the old fang to the new fang is kind of poorly understood. It's not fully understood? Poorly at, at best, oh, yeah. really. We kind of think that what's going on there is, is one channel, there's a membrane that has to be built to kind of swap the venom flow. So if you, you know, have a snake that, you know, mem maybe that membrane is not fully built, mm -hmm. then you get a lot of what we call back pressure with the venom, where it mm -hmm. actually just starts coming out of like where that secondary valve is, is into yeah. the actual uh, fang. Is there a valve there? Yeah, so there's, there's yeah. two valves, there's the primary, secondary, and then there's the two venom glands really. The primary gland, which is like the secretory epithelium and the lumen and all types of stuff. And then you have this secondary gland that almost looks like a little tiny teardrop right before the venom goes through that second mm -hmm. valve into the fang. And so when you have back pressure, you can see it sometimes with the capillary tubes when we have them slid over the fangs. It just starts like coming over the top. 
and then with this, that's where this was came from. Yeah, and that's where that's where this stuff came from. Because um, both those fangs were completely in there. Mm-hmm. So, so there's yeah, probably quite a bit. That. Yeah, probably quite a bit, like where that fang connected. It just wasn't a total. Complete Do you have seal. an idea of how frequent they shed their old fangs? Because we find fangs all the time in stool and in the yeah. cage, and I so mean, we've been collecting only peroxide them, so they're nice and white and. Uh, based on you know my experience work, working in captive facilities, mm -hmm. it's just like it's a species and individual thing. I'm just gonna push him right into it. I'm, just mess with that. I'm a little shaky. That's so cool. Alright guys, so that went awesome, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks again to Sam here for doing some extractions, letting us watch and film that. And, uh, yeah, we're not by any means like a Venom lab milking facility, but we're ob obviously happy to help with research uh, here and there. So, that's what today is about, and hope you enjoyed watching. Mm -hmm.